Hello everyone and welcome to the Vortex, where lies and falsehoods are trapped and exposed. I'm Michael Voris coming to you from Rome. So with the incredible confusion surrounding the now concluded synod, self-styled Catholic conservatives are piling on Pope Francis, scoring points and being hailed as brave and courageous for taking on the Pope. It's a cheap way to score points. Have things accelerated under Pope Francis in a negative trajectory? Sure. But the Catholic media and blogs, comprised almost entirely of concerned Catholics without a shred of professional secular experience, were almost silent as in the years gone by as the problem was developing before Pope Francis. We and others have rightfully pointed out the heresy, the heterodoxy, and dissent among very key players here at the Synod, placed in their roles by Pope Francis. But a very important historical question is being overlooked here. How did these men rise to the levels that Pope Francis could appoint them to these posts in the first place? Let's go down a quick overview of some of the more troublesome prelates. Cardinal Lorenzo Baldessari was consecrated bishop by John Paul and placed on the powerful Congregation for Bishops by Pope Benedict. Homosexualist Bruno Forte, Archbishop Bruno Forte, was made Archbishop by John Paul in 2004 and personally laid hands on by then Cardinal Ratzinger. Pope Benedict, only one of 26 men ever made bishop by him personally. Homosexualist Donald Wuerl was made bishop by John Paul and created a cardinal by Pope Benedict in 2010. New Zealand's John Dew was made cardinal by Pope Francis, true, but he was consecrated a bishop by John Paul. Woman deacon supporter Canadian Paul Andre Du Rocher was made bishop by John Paul in 1997 and made archbishop by Benedict in 2011. Essentially heretical, Cardinal Marx was made bishop by John Paul in 1996 and it was Pope Benedict who placed him in the position to become this troublesome and this much power by making him cardinal in 2010, Pope Benedict. John Paul made Walter Casper both bishop in 1989 and cardinal in 2001. This after then Cardinal Ratzinger had already publicly crossed swords with him over the whole Holy Communion for Divorce and Remarried question which Casper had already been rambling on about for 30 years. Exceedingly liberal Archbishop Charles Palmer Buckle, the only African to talk openly in favor of the communion question, was made bishop and archbishop by John Paul. Another exceedingly liberal African, Peter Turkson, was made bishop and archbishop by Pope John Paul. Cardinal Oswald Gracias of India, a favorite of Pope Francis, was made a cardinal by Pope Benedict. Brisbane's, uh, Brisbane, Australia's Archbishop Mark Coleridge was raised to his high place as Archbishop by Pope Benedict. All kinds of troublesome prelates, Roger Mahoney, homosexuals Joseph Bernadine, sex abuse covering up Cardinal Daniels, Theodore McCarrick, were all made cardinals by Pope St. John Paul. And the list of prelates who trouble Catholic media types has one more name on it, Cart made cardinal by John Paul, Jorge Bergoglio. During all these appointments by John Paul, one of his most intimate advisors was then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, hailed as hero by many in the conservative crowd. Once he became Pope, he continued a string of very questionable and troublesome appointments. While he did appoint some good guys, as Pope Francis has, he has enough bad guys on his role to raise some serious questions, including some of the big names at this synod, like Baldessari, Homosexualist Forte, Wuerl, and Marx, who owe their current prestige and cardinalship directly to Pope Benedict. At less, and lest anyone think this is attacking the Pope, Joseph Ratzinger isn't the Pope anymore. And this is a question that is completely overlooked during all the hand-wringing going on here at the Synod, in all the analysis and reporting in the Catholic blogosphere and Catholic websites. The whole reason we are here in October of 2015 is because of what Pope Benedict did in February of 2013. He resigned, abdicated, abandoned the office of Pope a monumental action not yet, not yet fully realized for the enormous earthquake it caused in the church. Forget for a moment all the rumors that it was done for blackmail or financial threats or whatever, we may never know. What he did is important because he did it. He surrendered to whatever the forces were he thought he could not resist. The Holy Father abandoned his flock, his children, and it was that single action that has brought all of this about. 
Francis may have lit a fuse here, but Pope Benedict laid the dynamite. He has now set in motion a series of events that the church may take decades or even perhaps, God forbid, centuries to recover from without the much longed for and prayed for direct heavenly intervention. For the past eight years, Church Militant has been calling out the problem of these bishops and many others. Our new book, Militant, spells that out in much detail. Yet many of the Catholic blogs and websites, some of whom actually called us and told us in private, don't talk about the bishops, are now more than happy to strut around damning Francis and the Synod while ignoring the real underlying cause of this chaos. Pope Benedict's fingerprints are all over this Synod. Many of these troubling characters, as we've said, were put into their places by him personally and others indirectly. When everyone in the Catholic blogs and websites is calling on clarity from Pope Francis, where are all of their appeals from these same websites for Pope Benedict to step forward right now and say something, give us something clear? Surely, of all people, you would think he is disturbed and troubled at heart at all of this madness. Madness propagated by his men, anointed at his own hand. Shouldn't he be issuing a public statement regarding these heresies? He resigned because of health reasons, but going on three years later, his health seems just fine. He greets pilgrims, says hello with them. Contrast that to Pope John Paul, who actually had a health issue. Recall that scene, that very touching scene, where struggling mightily with Parkinson's, he issued his last blessing from the window of the Apostolic Palace right there, shortly before his death, set an example beyond words. When Pope Benedict was elected, he said publicly, pray for me that I do not flee for fear of the wolves. Yet that is exactly what he did. He turned around and ran away, abandoning the flock to wolves he had led into the sheepfold. Believe me, it's not that Church Militant doesn't see the problems with this pontificate, but we think there's enough blame to go around that all guilty parties should be exposed, not just scoring cheap clickbait points by piling on. There's a much deeper story here. The reality is that whatever comes out of this synod, many of these malformed, evil, wicked clerics are simply going to return to their dioceses or high offices and keep doing what they've been doing for decades, trying to crush the authentic faith. The Synod was an attempt to institutionalize that and make it official. What Benedict's resignation has done is fundamentally change the papacy. It has caused a cataclysm far greater than what has followed in the wake of the Second Vatican Council. You barely hear a reference to Vatican II here at all these days. It's all about Pope Francis. Immediately following the Council, liberals and progressives spoke in terms of the Church as if she hadn't existed before 1965. Today, they speak in even more narrow terms, as if she never existed before Pope Francis. Even Pope John Paul's 1980 heralded exhortation on the family, Familiaris Consortio, has been essentially pushed aside. The damage of Benedict's resignation is now coming into full focus. The Church has been reduced in the common mind to just the Pope, nothing else. What Pope Benedict did may even rise to the level of immoral. Recall that there is the history of St. Peter running out of Rome when Nero fired up the persecution. Suddenly on the Via Appia, our blessed Lord appeared to him walking toward Rome, and Peter said to him, Quo vadis Domine, where are you going, Lord? And Jesus answered, I'm going to Rome to be crucified again. Peter got the message and turned back around, went into Rome, right here on Vatican Hill, and was martyred. That is precisely what Benedict did not do. And because of it, he has introduced an element into the papacy that may never be capable of being overcome except by another direct intervention by our Lord. Ironically, it's Pope Benedict. He's the one who invented the term the hermeneutic of continuity versus the hermeneutic of rupture. Yet, he is the very one who has introduced this rupture and its resulting confusion into the papacy. In an era where fatherhood has become so disgraced, Pope Benedict is the one who will be remembered as abandoning his children in the hour of their great need. This is the kind of analysis that Catholics need to hear, not just hand-wringing and piling on Pope Francis so you can get a bunch of people to click on your blog and register little combox comments. There is much, much more about the faith and the current crisis that many Catholics simply do not know. It's why we're asking you to sign up for a premium account and help support our work here. 
We have hundreds of hours of programming to help you learn the faith more intensely, something we're all going to have to do to survive the coming attacks. So please join us in our effort and sign up today just by clicking on the premium button. God love you, and please keep us and our work in your prayers. I'm Michael Voris. Hi, welcome to God's Green Earth. I'm Rodney Pelletier. Welcome to Treasury of the Church Gregorian Chant. This has been Houses Built on Sand.